Welcome everyone. My name is Pranava Aduri. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Greylock Partners. We're an early stage venture capital firm located in the Bay Area. In the past, I've worked as a founding engineer in uh, multiple infrastructure unicorn startups. And um, uh, most recently, I was over at AWS where uh, I led a brand new service to over $200 million in run rate. Today, I wanted to share with you um, where we see service meshes and where I'm personally excited about uh, the challenges and uh, where they're gonna be headed. So let's get started. Initially, uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about service meshes, uh, why we have them, uh, the motivation behind them and the current state of service meshes. And then I'll spend a little bit of time going over where I see them going next and uh, where I'm personally excited about. So, to understand why service meshes are needed, we really have to start by looking at why DevOps is needed and why organizations practice DevOps. D modern DevOps is practiced for three main reasons and th or three main objectives, agility, stability, and accountability slash ownership. Agility so that teams can move fast and can deploy code quickly and react to bugs or incidents quickly and uh, iterate on what's deployed. Stability so that when they're moving quickly, they have the uh, mechanisms uh, in place to ensure that what they're releasing passes uh, a series of uh, tests and whatever other qualifications are needed to ensure a quality release. And then accountability and ownership so that for a given function, a set of functionalities or a service, there is an owner that is servicing that, uh, that, that bit of code and uh, someone that is uh, in charge of determining how that will change over time. One implementation of these three objectives is the microservice pattern that uh, most organizations deploy today. Now, when we talk about microservices, um, we really have to talk about complexity, uh, especially when it comes to communication. As an example, Netflix, as of this presentation, has over 1,000 microservices. Now, each microservice has to talk to other microservices, uh, and, and uh, there will be dependencies across microservices. When you have 1,000 plus microservices, these dependencies can grow immensely complex, and individually being aware of each uh, dependency and how communication is happening between services explicitly uh, becomes intractable at a certain point in time. Additionally, when you have a microservice architecture, some services will inherently be dealing with more sensitive data than others. As a result, you might want to uh, rope off certain services or dictate that certain services can only be accessed by other services that are privy to uh, the data and API that those services will expose. Next, we always have to assume that a service and the network can be compromised. So these are really the complexities that give rise to, uh, to the way service meshes have evolved to today. Namely, our let's start with the communication goals. The first goal would be observability, which is for the traffic that you have uh, going on in your network, you wanna be able to monitor it. You wanna be able to log it and Logs are a great indicator, uh, and observability in general is an indicator of service help, which is, do I have a service that is repeatedly failing requests? Next, we have security. Uh, as a goal, you would like that all communication between two services, or any, uh, any combination of services, is encrypted so that in the event that your network is compromised, the communication still can't be deciphered. In addition to uh, the communication itself being encrypted, you also want to ensure that uh, a service is who the service attests it is as being. So attestation and authentication, uh, the idea that uh, a service is, in fact, what it re what is reporting itself to be. Finally, there's a notion of control. Uh, the idea that uh, you should be able to set policies for how your traffic behaves uh, in your network. Uh, this can be in the form of rate limiting, it can be in the form of defining circuit breakers, uh, it can be uh, in the form of uh, uh, authorization and ACL saying that only certain services can talk to other services. So that's the control aspect of, uh, of, uh, of the communication goal. Now, 
if we talk about an implementation of these goals that we've just outlined, it gives rise to the service meshes that we have today. And so what is a service mesh then? It's an architecture that enables the previous goals for container-based environments, right? And the way service meshes have been built so far is they don't require businesses change the actual underlying business logic. Instead, they rely on proxies that sit in between business logic and the other services that they're attempting to communicate with. And the proxies uh, are where policies are implemented and enforced. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, let's first start with a mesh architecture. Modern meshes are broken into two planes, if you will. There's the control plane, and then there's the data slash proxy plane. And so the control plane is where um, uh, administrators and organizations will define policies. Uh, again, policies can be, for example, uh, rate limiting. They can be circuit breaking policies. They can be policies around um, which uh, service is allowed to talk to which other services and what endpoints it's allowed to, it's allowed to talk to. So the control plane is really where uh, these policies are created. And the control plane will take those user defined policies and translate them into appropriate configurations for the proxies in the data plane. And so the control plane is responsible for keeping uh, all the uh, moving parts of the data plane in sync uh, with the user provided configurations. Uh, and then I've defined data plane already in, in talking about a control plane, but the data slash proxy plane is where policies are enforced. A quick uh, dive into uh, the different types of meshes that we're seeing right now. So there's two big patterns that we're seeing now. There's the sidecar proxy, which is by far the most dominant strategy that's, uh, or the type that we're seeing. And then there's the node proxy. So in a sidecar proxy, a proxy sits alongside each service instance. So uh, in Kubernetes parlance, you have a pod, uh, which is uh, which will contain uh, an instance of your business logic, and in the sidecar proxy pattern, a sidecar proxy uh, a proxy will be sitting alongside each copy of your service instance, and whenever that service instance attempts to talk to the network, it'll go through the proxy, and all the policy enforcement that is set in the control plane gets enforced and enacted by that proxy that's sitting alongside uh, the service instance. Uh, if you had to use a tourist analogy, this is akin to every tourist having their own personal translator. Another uh, type of mesh that we see uh, is a node proxy. And this is where instead of the proxy sitting alongside every service instance, it actually sits at the node level. So multiple instances can be running at the node level and they'll all make use of that single proxy running at the node level. To look at the tourist analogy again, this is akin to having one translator per group of uh, tourists. And so there are some advantages to the node uh, proxy uh, approach. Uh, one of them being, if you want to upgrade uh, the proxy that you're using for your service mesh, in a sidecar proxy model, every single existing pod needs to be rotated with the new version of the proxy. And so uh, there is some impact uh, to your business objectives that you're running versus in a node proxy, you still have to swap them out, but uh, the amount of instances impacted is reduced. Next, I wanna talk about the service mesh interface and why it's so important. So the service mesh interface is a standard interface for container service meshes. This is important because there's so many different implementations of service meshes out there. And one of the core issues that'll come up with any organization that is trying to adopt a service mesh is which one to use. Everyone has their benefits and they have their downsides as well. Not having lock-in to a single mesh is actually very useful for reducing an organization's friction to adopting a service mesh because they know that if they use the constructs uh, as defined in the SMI spec, uh, they can rotate to another service mesh uh, with, with little effort. And so the service mesh interface standardizes some common mesh use cases, for example, traffic targets, route groups, and traffic metrics. So now that we've taken a look at um, the types of service meshes, uh, the mesh architecture, and um, where we're at right now, let's take a look at what I'm excited about. So Spiffy is a standard for attestation of identity. That is, for a given service, how, do you, how does a service prove that it is, in fact, who it says it is? Now, previously, 
uh, Spiffy was not a standard that was adopted by all meshes. The good news is most meshes now have a partial implementation of Spiffy. Uh, I look forward to this being the standard de facto adoption for identity in meshes going forward. Smart NICs are another area of interest. Um, smart NICs are uh, NICs that actually have DPUs that can be programmed. Now, smart NICs are another area that are very exciting, especially when it comes to high performance networking uh, in containerized environments. Uh, you see this with uh, the adoption of uh, bare metal Kubernetes. Now, what's interesting about smart NICs is you can start doing uh, offloading compute intensive properties like uh, crypto, and you can offload them to the NICs themselves. This paves the way towards high performance networking in Kubernetes, where you can really start unlocking speeds beyond 40 Gbps. Next, hybrid cloud is here to stay. And uh, the service mesh story really wouldn't be complete without having a comprehensive play that also allows organizations to extend to on-prem deployments. And what we see is plays like Kuma that are being designed both for Kubernetes and uh, container native environments, but also to be working with uh, traditional VMs on-prem. Uh, going off of the hybrid uh, example, Within an organization, different teams might have different requirements, and so they might be using different service meshes. As a result, when you have cross-functional teams that need to work together, it's good to have a unified mesh management system that will allow certain policies to be enforced org-wide and also allow you to configure these meshes in an org-wide fashion. So we see MeshHub as an example of someone uh, paving the way towards that, and uh, I definitely am excited to see uh, how MeshHub will, uh, will, evolve, will evolve in that sense. Next, meshes rely on proxies. So if you want a certain capability to be built out in Istio, for example, at the, at the, at the data plane level, if the mesh doesn't support it, uh, Istio can't do it. And so enhancing proxies in turns enhances the capabilities of meshes. So WebAssembly is a really exciting development from that standpoint that allows third-party developers to add filters uh, presently for Envoy to enhance its capabilities. And so when you start uh, allowing uh, the proxies to take on new capabilities, you can start uh, adding uh, functionality that, uh, that is traditionally reserved for other areas of the network stack. I see uh, WebAssembly as a very powerful enabler of future, compat of future uh, capabilities for, uh, for service meshes. What I would also like to see is an open uh, WebAssembly standard uh, that is adopted across service meshes. So not just uh, Envoy, but uh, for example, Linkerd. Uh, as a matter of fact, Linkerd has mentioned that uh, they would like to, um, they're considering the possibility of uh, uh, interopping with uh, the WebAssembly standard that's been established for Envoy. And this would lead to really cool use cases where in addition, in the same way that what SMI did for uh, policies, uh, there could be a, uh, an equivalent implementation for um, a standard uh, WebAssembly that uh, multiple meshes can use. Next, um, I think there's also a lot of opportunity when it comes to uh, having existing security offerings vend WebAssembly extensions for service meshes. An example of this could be as an organization, you might be using a DLP suite. The DLP suite could vend a uh, WebAssembly extension that you could be incorporating into your service mesh. So in this way, um, I think the future is very bright for service meshes in terms of being composable with other services that you use in your organization. So these are what I'm looking forward to. And uh, if you have any questions or any uh, suggestions of what you would like to see, I would love to hear from you. So please feel free to reach out. I'm at the Nava on Twitter. Uh, looking forward to it and thank you for your time today.